This talk is streams, the data structure we need, or it can be shortened to OMG streams. Feel free to use it as a hashtag. Uh, and I am Pam Selly. You can find me on Twitter at Pamasaur. My blog is thewebofwar.com. So the thesis of this talk, and it's a talk for all levels, so we'll go from beginning to the end. <laughs> and so streams are the most awesome data structure that you don't know enough about. So first, we'll talk about streams, kind of context, what they are. Streams, why you should be super excited about them as a data structure. And we'll talk about, because JavaScript is my jam, we'll talk about streams and how they're expressed in JavaScript now. And we'll also talk about some libraries and emerging standards because it's JavaScript, and so there's always something new. So that's the agenda for the day. So streams, streams, streams. So starting with some history. So I, when I started getting really interested in learning about streams as a data structure, I wanted to see where it came from. And it seems, as far as I could tell, that streams first made their appearance as a data structure in Unix. And so if you don't think you know much about streams, there's a decent chance that you've used streams as a data structure just in your terminal on the day-to-day. So all glory to the pipe operator. So the pipe operator is that skinny line in between these two commands. So cat being a command that concatenates to the terminal, and grep being a global search and replace. And so in this, we have a text file that's best animals, and we're going to search within it for instances of cats. So best animals by itself. And then let's search case insensitive for instances of cat, because the internet is run by cats. And we see that we use the pipe operator to take the output from the first command and send it to the second command. So that's what happened. And that's the, the red lines, the pipe operator. So but what are streams? So that's, that's a, oh, you've probably been using streams without even realizing it. And that's where they kind of come from historically. But what are they? So streams are an abstract data structure, meaning that when we talk about abstract data structure, abstract data structures, I sometimes have a hard time wrapping my head around them because they have that convenient word abstract in front of them. And so what that means is that we might not, in some cases we will, but we'll see streams expressed, but they can be expressed in many different ways and because they're abstract. So sometimes it might not even be called a stream, and sometimes it'll be called a stream, and there will be many different implementations of it. And you probably, you might have even been to talks about streams already uh, here at StrangeLoop. So streams are an abstract data structure. And I'm going to do a real world demo, a la elementary school science class, to show you how streams work. So over here, I have some cups. So in, I'm going to go left to right. So my right, your left. So in the first cup, I have water. And the ultimate goal is that it has to get to this cup. But because reasons, or business logic, it has to go through this middle cup in between. It has to. It's the world. So we can do it this way. And we do this kind of operation all the time. We take a source, and we transform it somehow, and we put it somewhere, and then we ultimately output it. However, if we want to do it a different way, just shuffle these up, let's replace that middle cup with something a little different. So that's pretty much how streams work if you were to teach it in elementary school science class, in my humble opinion. And it's a fun way to think about streams. So instead of pouring from one into the next and into the next and doing things sequentially in that way, we send it through to the output. So I, I'm going to reference SICP a couple times in the talk. And just in case you haven't heard of it, uh, Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs is a generally a textbook. Uh, if you have a degree in computer science, you may have used it. If you have a degree in si computer science and you haven't read it, you probably feel guilty about it. 
And so what does SICP, this canonical text, say about streams? So SICP says streams are delayed list. OK, so what does that mean? So a delayed list means that we can treat them mostly like a list structure, but you don't have or you don't have to have all the values at once. So it's a data structure that lets us do list operations without the expense and annoyance of having to have them in a list structure. So they become really powerful. So why would you use them? So they're really powerful, but why? So because we can't or don't want to hold everything in memory, so we got to avoid holding things in the middle cup in our science experiment. And bandwidth is expensive. These are facts that are still true about the world. They haven't changed yet. Uh, but meanwhile, while bandwidth is still expensive and we don't want to store all the things in memory, streams are really great data structure. So streams and why you should be super stoked about them. So streams let you represent possibly infinite data. Infinite data making you essentially a wizard. And they're really, really cool. And that's why I got really excited about them as a data structure, and I wanted to write a talk about them. So what are some things that don't have an end? You say infinite data. There's no such thing as infinite data. Wrong. <laughs> we have natural numbers. There's no such thing as a terminal natural number. Because anytime we have any number, we can always make a new natural number by adding one to it. So there's no such thing as a final natural number. Weather theoretically ends eventually. Uh, user input, keystrokes, so in JavaScript world, especially on the client side, we deal with this all the time. Uh, large data sets in your heartbeat, these have stars next to them because they definitely do have an end. Um, but you just don't know when it is. So while you're, you're collecting data, you operate on the assumption that you don't, you don't know when it ends. And streams let you do that. So why I brought up SACP is I don't really like using quotes and talks, but I just really, really like this. So stream processing lets us model systems that have state without ever using assignment or mutable data. That is really awesome. So let's do it again. <laughs> so stream processing lets you have your state, but you don't have to use assignment or mutable data, the things that we aren't that into. So you can move faster. You aren't storing things in memory, and we aren't mutating data, a very popular topic exchange loop. So modes of streams. So that's streams at the very abstract sense. But then you actually have kind of two modes that you can express streams in. You can express them in push and pull modes. So what's a push stream? So a push stream is like the fire hose. So it's, I think the, the fire hydrant is a pretty apt image to think of. It's just coming out. And so, and especially in streams, you'll see the language expressed in multiple ways. So we have a producer, a consumer, we have a source, we have an observed and the observer. And we're using all this different language and we're talking about the same thing. It's all streams. But because they're an abstract data structure, I think that's why we end up using a lot of different language. So you might be using a push stream if you see things like callbacks. So when I have stuff from the source, do something with it. They're non-blocking, so the fire hydrant's just blasting stuff at you, or the fire hose is open. And the downside, because everything has a downside, there's you know, a downside to any implementation, is possible overload. So if you, it's like if you opened a fire hose on a tiny basil plant, it wouldn't handle it very well. So thinking about the context will change what kind of stream implementation you would want to use. So a pull stream is the ideal, like ideally the opposite in a way. So instead of the source or the producer pushing all that, so push stream, pushing all that data at you, and the pull stream, the consumer is in charge of getting their data. So if you have a tiny basil plant, it's like it could wave its hand and say, like, oh, I need more water, please. Uh, and so you might be using a pull stream if you see things like iterators, and they are blocking. And so I, I love this from, I think I first heard it from Jessica Kara's talks, that you'll have to time out. Because if you are blocking, you need to never, ever block forever. And so I think of this, I think of a 
whole streams, like, it's kind of like a lake. And there's like a lake of data. And you have you a bucket. <laughs> and you have a bucket, and you can walk to the lake, and you can get your water. Uh, there's a lot of water themes here. And so you can walk back to your campsite or what have you. But while you're doing that, you can't do anything else. Like, you're carrying the bucket and back and forth, and you can take the bucket and do your thing, but then you have to walk back, and that takes time, so it's blocking. So that's how pull streams, that's their trade-off, is that while you have more control over when you get your data, you end up blocking. So streams in JavaScript. So what do we have right now in JavaScript? So node streams are conveniently named, are push streams. So a node stream throws data at the next, which makes a lot of sense in a JavaScript conscience, too. So the classic example, so Substack has all this great stuff about streams and node, and so that's going to be in the reference sheet. But here is a simple example of a, a silly node server. So it does, does the thing. Here's the important part. So the important part is so the FS file system reads a file, and then it reads it on the memory, and then it sends the data to the response. So that's one way to write a server. That's, you know, that's one way. Another way is to write a server with a readable stream. And so here's the important part. The spacing's a little, a little different so that I could fit in well. But so the stream, we create a readable stream, and then I, I love that this is why we mentioned Unix as well earlier, is it uses the pipe keyword. So I, I do like node streams a lot. I feel like they fit the mental model of what a stream data structure is really well for me. Uh, so we actually take the stream and we pipe it to the response, just like we would in Unix. Well, not just, but eh, you get the idea. So we're piping rather than using memory. And so when we see this in action on the server, you can make the server a lot faster. You aren't, aren't, don't have to store things in that second vessel, second or nth vessel. So go no streams. They're awesome. I like them. So what else? So in ES6, or also known as ES2015, uh, we have generators. And so this is a very new thing to JavaScript land. So it's, it's available in other languages in different forms. But in JavaScript, this is how we have generators. So generators are reusable and possible functions. If, you were to, if, if you're in JavaScript and you're having trouble getting generators, this is the thing. This is they are reusable and possible functions. So that sounds familiar. Are they pull streams? <laughs> so because you ask for more when you want more, and that's how a generator works. It's an, it's an iterator. It's blocking. It looks like all those things that we talk about when we talk about, uh, talk about pull streams. So when you use a generator, if you want to move to the next value, you, you call next. You say, I'm going to take the bucket again and go get more, more data. So you know it's a generator when. This is how it's talking about how they look in JavaScript. So in, in JavaScript, we have the function and the star and then yield. And if you see these two bits, you are working with a generator. So here's a simple example. So a function something yields two. Oh, OK, great. So it's reusable. So we can create an instance of it. And so we say s equals a something. So s is a something. And then we say s.next, and then that will give us back our two. We'll get our yield. So generators demos. So let's do, have some, some fun with generators. So here's a simple generator. Let's we'll see if it works right away. Yep. So every, each time I click the button, I'm going to iterate through the generator. So we'll look at it happening, and then we'll look at the code that makes it happen. So we're console logging something, something else. Or something else entirely, and the generator's done. And if I keep hitting the button, it's still done. It's read once. So reusable and possible functions, but they're read once. Like once you get all the water out of the lake, there's no water water in the lake. So that's a simple generator. So let's see what it looks like over here. So here's some, some setup. And so here, just here at the top of the elements and clicking. And so here's our, remember we said, OK, we have our function star, and we have our yield. So that means we're working with a generator. And so when we go through it, when we first call it, so next value is what we're doing each time we click. So we, 
we create a, a paragraph element, and I'm actually passing, I'm yielding this so that I can inspect the done value. So generator done is, so generator.next.done. And so that's actually calling the generator.next there and appending it to the, to the document body. So what's happening? So each time we call it, so the first time we call it, we're getting to this yield. And so we yield this, that's the first time. So then we saw a console log something. The next time we call it, we console log something else, and then we get to the yield. The third time we call it, we have no more yields, but we have still a final line in our generator. And so that's when that gets executed, which is a really great use case for a cleanup or a finally or something like that that you might want to do at the end of the consumption of some data. So now that we've looked at it, let's just try it again just to kind of embed that knowledge. Oh, there we go. I should have pushed that button down. Right? Something, something else, and something else entirely. And so that's the a simple and a minorly less trivial example. Let's switch to, uh, to a different one. So just change the JavaScript file, and then we'll have a different generator running when I should have pushed that button down. Cheat to win. All right, here we go. All right, so generate. John went to the store and said, hey there, to the clerk. So that's our, our, our different generator. So what's actually happening? So this still trivial, but minorly less trivial generator, but an example of a reusable and possible function. So string breaker, because reasons, it breaks up a string and gives you back a word each time unless there is a phrase or statement in quotes. It's very simple. So the string breaker has an accumulator. We look at for, for of, which is actually also a cool ES6 syntax thing that I'm really into. Uh, you were sad about for in. Now you have for of. Be happy. And so we have, a, we have kind of a, a, a state machine of sorts running through. And so we yield, and then we return at the end just to be good about it. And so here's at the end. So we're, each time we click, we're appending a new word. So John went to the store and said, hey there. So that's our in quotes, to the clerk. And with the for of, we could also do this. We can use for of with generators. So not only with, you know, with object literals where everyone has done this, where we use for in and we end up with indexes instead of values, and it's terrible. Um, so, and we can iterate through the whole generator. And so we can just say, I just want everything from the generator. So if you, ha you can set up more complex generators like this and say, and just go through all of it. Give me, give me the data from the generator. So that's the basics of JavaScript generators, aka pull streams. So can you use them? Uh, I'm actually doing these demos in, in Chrome with no polyfills. So yes, but like everything in JavaScript, you probably need a polyfill if you have to support you know, other people. Um, so Babel.js is the transpiler that is the, the oper operator of choice in this space. So step three, libraries and emerging standards. So we saw some, some you know, readable, or some push streams and some pull streams in JavaScript that are today-ish. And we also have some libraries and emerging standards that are really exciting. So some libraries for working with streams. So there's I, the three ones that I would say are the major ones that I like a lot, uh, Bacon, Highland, and Rx. So Bacon, here's Bacon.js with the scary parts taken out. Uh, if you didn't get that joke, I crossed out everything that said functional reactive programming. Um, so Bacon is great. It's a really great entry point to doing stream programming in JavaScript because it's very jQuery. I, I believe it even uses the dollar sign. And so you get your list operations on stream-like objects, such as event streams. So like, remember, user events, clicks, hovers, any, any kind of browser event is a series of it's a series of values that we don't know when it, when it ends, so it can be expressed as a stream. Highland.js, I really like, and this is kind of the first one of these that I got into, uh, is because I like that it's a stream constructor. So I, I like when the words actually map to the, 
com computational concepts. And so the stream constructor accepts an array of values or a generator function as an optional argument. So their constructor lets you put in lots of different values. So you could use arrays, generators, node streams, uh, jQuery elements, promises. Uh, I actually really like it for this reason. I'm sure that lots of people don't like it for this reason. That is providing a common interface for many different types. So I think that's really cool. And then RxJS quickly summarized as reactive tools, stream-friendly, batteries included. If you're at StrangeLoop, you might be familiar with the reactive X family, and RxJS is part of that family. Or, and there's a version being built right now I'll briefly mention later. So hold on, reactive programming. This is the Trojan horse in the JavaScript talk. Uh, but no, we're also StrangeLoop, so you aren't surprised. Um, so this video helps a lot, and this was actually probably, it might have been my favorite talk at StrangeLoop in 2014. Uh, Evan's talk on the formulations of FRP. And I've, I've watched this multiple times. And in terms of being able to understand FRP or RP uh, conceptually, I really think it's absolutely fantastic. Also recommended, Stoltz has this intro to Rx blog post that's actually a gist, but it's really good. And so I highly recommend reading that, because if you're, if you're following along with this, you're probably having that realization that in the world that we exist in now, like streams, I would say streams are like the data structure. Like we exist in massive amounts of data. We exist in real-time data. So data where we don't know when it's going to end. And data structure for you, for you, my friends, is streams. So his post really does a good, a good job of getting you into that mindset. So some emerging standards. So again, it's JavaScript. So of course, someone's writing some specifications on this. So let's see what we maybe or may not get. <laughs> so the thing that it, this is really cool. So there's actually a browser stream standard so that we could actually get a stream data type in the browser. This is a rough one because it's going to involve browser vendors. It's not a standard library kind of thing. It's a browsers have to be able to support it. But if and when it happens, it's going to be really awesome. And among the many people working on it, there are people from the Node team who are involved in this spec. And of course, you can always check the specs, and they're being updated constantly. Fetch API. The stream spec is really like also that you should get really excited about this one. So the Fetch API is going to prevent you from ever having to write XML HTTP request ever again or pulling in jQuery so you don't have to. So the Fetch API provides that interface that everyone has pretty commonly adopted the $.ajax style and makes it into a native API. And of course, there's polyfills for this. And so you can, you can use it now if you're willing to add a polyfill. Um, but the really cool thing about the Fetch API is that not only is it providing that kind of $.ajax is, you know, get the stuff and then, but that's kind of like, that's like the, the silly, the first node server we looked at. In the future, when we have the browser streams, it's going to look like that second node server. And this is really, really cool. So when we, because I mean, how many times have you had to, you, you get your data, and then you have to you know, deal with it being JSON, of course. So we get response at JSON. When that is streams, you should, my dream is that you will be able to do things like massive data visualizations. Like, that's the thing that I'm most excited about. And that's like the beginning, you know? That's just the most obvious thing to me, which means that people are going to do really cool things with it if massive data visualizations is the first thing I thought of. But being able to handle data without pagination, big deal. Um, being able to, and I'm, I'm just so excited about the data visualization opportunities in this. Object.observe. So you might have seen some talks about this. Uh, it's, I, if I were to you know, bet on a, a standard, I think I might bet on this one as something that's probably going to happen. ES7, aka ES 2016. Uh, so not now, eventually. Uh, but object.observe. So given an object or object things, which in JavaScript is almost everything, uh, we can observe it and then react to changes. So does, that sounds familiar, right? That sounds like a push stream. So it's a series of events, and we react when it changes. We're consuming the data as we get it. The observable type, really cool one. And so this is what we see in the RxJS library. So this existing library that people have been using for a while 
is also it, the the main you know stuff of it is an observable type, and that's actually proposed to be added to the standard library next year. So proposal for ES7, so we can create an observable of values or events, and then we can do list operations on them. Remember, list operations without the annoyance and expense of lists. So some small projects using some of these tools. So we talked about history, we talked about JavaScript today, we talked about emerging things, and I've got some examples of me actually doing stuff with these so that you can actually see them in action. So the last week blog. So tell me what's new from the last week on my blogs. So this somewhat trivial example. So watch the screen. If I'm, oh, am I on the Wi-Fi? We'll see. Otherwise, everything else is already offline. So, but this one depends on hitting the network. Did you see that? Did you see it didn't, it didn't render like a usual browser page. So what's actually happening in the last week blog is it's fetching all these. There's a YAML file in the project that has uh, names and indexes of, or names and locations of different blogs so that I could check and see, hey, like, are there, you know, have my friends written anything in the last week? I put New York Times up there because sadly my friends aren't super prolific on their blogs. Um, but so you can see it actually went like this. It didn't, it, you didn't kind of get a kind of standard browser flash. And so that's what's actually happening in the last week blog is it's, and it uses Highland to do this, and of course the, the source is uh, on my GitHub. Um, it's very trivial, but hopefully that makes it more accessible to see what's going on. Uh, but so we go and get all the source of the blogs, we get their RSS, transform it, filter it, list operations, and then we pipe that response to the browser as we get it. So we don't have to wait for, you know, because as cool as processing RSS feeds is, uh, we don't have to store all that in memory. We just we deal with it and we're done with it, and then we get our answer. So that is last week blog. So the space time app uses the Fetch API. Sadly, of course, it does. We don't have browser streams, but it does use the Fetch API. So what's the space time app? So this is a data visualization. So there's a DeLorean, and there's the plane of stars, and so you can drive your DeLorean. And you can see how the stars move over time. You can drive your DeLorean forward and backward. We've all seen the movies, right? So, um, so we've got, and it's really cool. Because if you think about, you know, and it's, I, I think I remember it's correct, like plus or minus 100,000 years. Um, but at that point, like relativity comes into play. But it's pretty cool to think about how like our stars didn't look the same as, you know, 1,000 years ago based on our place in space. Anyway, so this uses a lot of data. So what that actually looks like when it's using the Fetch API is it, uh, it fetches a stupid number of stars uh, and returns and then does stuff with the stars. And we, then we you know, do all this cool 3JS stuff to make a plane of stars and represent them in a visualization. Also bonus, uh, of course, if you're a JavaScript, you might have heard of, you know, every single build system. Um, but one of them is Gulp. And why Gulp is a build system, big fan, is that it, it relies on streams. So we do things, and we actually have a pipe operator. So I, really, I love when, they, when the language maps to the, the mental model. I feel like it, it makes it really sticky. And so that's, one of the, like, that's why when you switch from another build system to Gulp, you might see huge gains in speed. Because instead of storing things and then doing things with them, you're piping the values. You do sometimes get race conditions, but like that's going to happen. Um, and you can deal with it. I didn't deal with it very well here, but other people can. So fix missing off files. OK. So millennials to snake people. <laughs> so this uses object.observe to observe mutations to the DOM and appropriately update uses of the word millennial. So this was first written by Eric Bailey for Chrome. Uh, and I, I added the, the Firefox extension. And so you get something like this, which makes reading the news a lot better. <laughs> um, 
This paragraph is probably my favorite. So, replacing lots of vocabulary associated with millennials with appropriate snake-related puns. Uh, so, and the code using observe, so it's, you know, and it's, it's so disturbingly simple, it's so great. So we went, so walk the document and replace things and then set up your observers. We even replace the title of the document. So watch mutations, so watch when things changes, change it, watch when things change and hit our callback. Spoiler, that callback replaces mentions of the word millennial or, you know. I, my favorite is that millennial children become snakelets. Um, but yeah, all, all credit to Eric. I ported it to, to Firefox, but yeah, it was, a, it was a very fun and funny idea. So, and that's using streams. So we're using object.observe to react and update things. So an observable, Here's a, this is a bit of a trivial example using RxJS. I call it art. So this is silly art with RxJS. Hello, click to move the circle. So let's open the console as well. So moving circle around and I'm getting my coordinates back. So I could do other interesting things, but my, my art's very simple. You know, I like it that way sometimes. Uh, but so in RxJS, I just created an observable and we're just, we're watching clicks and we're reacting to them. I can do it pretty fast, too. Not as fast as a QA tester, but you know, um, no, it's perfect. So some interesting links. So some interesting links that we have are node streams. So conveniently, there's a website called nodestreams.com. How great. So, and I did, I referenced Substack and the stream handbook and stream adventure. So stream adventure is within the node school library. If you have not seen that, it's a command line, uh, interface game to learn Node, and Stream Adventure is one of them, so you can learn about streams in Node. Some generators, I really like, so Getify on the internet is Kyle Simpson, and he has this router example that he posted that I really like because it's, you know, especially when we get a new thing, it's hard to, like when I talk about the Fetch API, like or I think of kind of the most obvious thing, but then we gotta, we gotta be more creative. Like once we have a new field, we should try and do weird and interesting things. Uh, or, you know, useful, that's good too. So the router's useful. So the router is showing that, hey, we don't we tend to make routers a lot? What if we made a reusable <laughs> router? And so that's a generator. And in his book, You Don't Know JS, uh, there's the async and performance generators chapter, really like it. And Axel Rauschmeyer has fantastic resources on impending JavaScript standards all the time, but especially on this post on generators and def. And the, the, these slides are on the internet, and so you can go and get all the links straight from them. So those reactive programming libraries, Bacon, Highland, and Rx, and a few other reactive things that are cool. So RxJS is, is cool. It's got batteries included. However, it's not super usable like when you're coming to it as a new person. Uh, and it definitely has some performance gains to be made. And so what's happening right now is Rx is being, RxJS is being rewritten underneath another umbrella and all that is happening in the wild. The alpha is out. So you can go and you can contribute to it. I especially would love to see more people contributing docs um, because I'm, I'm doing that a bit. And it's always good, like, you know, Fresh set of eyes are some of the most invaluable things on emerging projects before they get too far down a bad path. And also created by Staltz are the Rx marbles, which if you're, if you're newer to some of those list operations or operating on those list, list uh, functions on streams, the Rx marbles are a really cool way to visualize it by Staltz who wrote that intro to Rx post. And if you said to yourself, all those libraries sound great, Pam, but I really need a JavaScript framework you can use cycle.js. And so this is a framework that is based on RxJS and creates, uses reactive programming as a first class citizen in the JavaScript framework. So it's pretty new. I'm interested to see where it's going, but it's definitely something if you're interested in this, you'll want to check out. So the slides are at psla.github.io, omg streams. I'll tweet out. And thank you very much. Uh, I, you can find me for questions mingling around. Uh, I'll do that. I also, so Twitter, Pamasaur, website, the Webivore, 
also have a podcast called Turing and Complete, and if you like the joke, you'll like the podcast. And we have stickers. So if you want some stickers uh, or questions to talk to me about, uh, talk to me after talk. So thank you so much. <laughs>